Hi everyone, welcome back to my Z80 computer series. So last time I was taking a look at input and I had a, a very basic program running but I wanted to, to look at something a little bit more complicated. Um, I've transferred all of the circuits onto the trainer board here so we've now got all eight of the buttons connected up here and I've, I've moved the buffer chip over here it's all wired up and everything is working. What I wanted to do next was to move on to a slightly more complicated program, but I felt like the clock speed is probably going to be too slow. So we'll, we will take a look at the um, new program and we'll run it with the clock speed as we've got here and, and we'll see the, the, um, the issue of speed. Um, and then I'll then move on to um, some ideas for running a faster clock. So here is the program. So we've got a few comments at the top. Um, anything that follows a semicolon is a comment. So all the purple text here are comments. So it says use two input buttons to move up and down memory addresses and display both the address and the contents of the address. So I've got my compiler directive here B into um, set to 32768 because I'm using a 32k ROM. That's just going to decide the size of the binary file when we eventually compile this. I've got another compiler directive org $0000. Um, that's just telling the compiler that we want this program to live at that address. So this will be sitting right at the bottom of our address space. And I've got this init code here. Um, so I'm loading the stack pointer with FF00 and I'm loading HL with 8000. That should be the first byte of our RAM. Um, I believe the last byte of ROM would be 7FFF. So the first byte would be first byte of RAM would be 8000. And then I'm loading the D register with the number 255. Now that's a decimal number because it doesn't have the dollar in front of it. Um, I could have written it in binary, I guess. Might have been a bit clearer. But basically I'm setting all the bits to 1 on register D. Then I've got the, the main loop. Let's just look at what the main loop does and then we'll break it down a bit. So I'm doing call output, call input. And I'm doing a compare with D. And then JRZ loop will go back to the beginning of the loop if that compare statement that we did here resulted in setting the zero flag. We'll come back to that in a second. But basically the, the main loop is calling output and input. So let's look, have a look at those subroutine calls. They're down the bottom. We'll start with the output. So I'm doing a push BC, so that's just to preserve the, the BC registers, or the value in the B and C registers. Um, then I'm loading B with address HL. Um, so when you see the brackets, we're talking about an address. So it's the address that is pointed to by HL. And if you remember right at the beginning, we loaded HL in the init code with the address 8000 or 8000. Um, so B will be loaded with the contents of that memory address. Then I'm loading C with zero. Now this is our output address. So our output devices. And output device zero is the green LEDs. And then I'm doing out C comma B. So we're going to put the value that's currently held in register B. We're going to output that to uh, IO address zero which is our green LED. So the value of that memory address is going to appear on the green LEDs. And then I'm just doing inc C out C comma L inc C out C comma H. Um, and that's the, the low byte and the high byte of the HL register pair. So that's H and L. And they're going to go out to the red LEDs, um, which are IO addresses one and IO address two. Finally, I'm going to pop BC and return. So with the push and pop, the BC registers will be preserved. So if you have a look at the input, 
and again I'm, I'm preserving the BC registers by doing a push BC and a pop BC at the end and then I'm loading C with zero now I don't actually have any um, input address decoding on the board at the moment so it wouldn't actually matter what value I loaded into register C this is the input address that we're going to be looking at um, but I could have put anything in there because every time we try and read from the input we're always going to get the value from those switches um, then I'm doing load A comma D now why am I doing that well this is to save the last input value to the A register so that when I load the new one in in the next instruction I can I can still look back at what, what it was previously um, I'm then doing an in D comma C so I'm loading the new input value into register D and then a pop BC in return so what will we have when we return from this input subroutine we'll have the previous value of the input in register A and we'll have the current value of the input in register D so if we go back to the main loop so it will have done this um, call input and then we do a compare D now that's comparing register D with register A and if you remember I just said register A holds the previous value and D holds the current value so we're comparing the current value with the previous value and the reason I'm doing that is to see if it's changed um, if it hasn't changed both values will be the same and if both values are the same the compare instruction will result in a zero and, and set the zero flag so then then I have JRZ loop so if there's no change in the input it will just continue to keep going around the loop so it will only fall out of the loop when we actually see a change so it will fall into this down block of code I'm then loading register A with 254 so I'm, I'm looking at the first bit I've uh, turned the first bit off and then I'm doing a compare D and I'm doing that to see if the, the first bit has been um, it reset pulled pulled low by the switch um, and if it has will result in the zero flag being set again uh, but this time I'm doing the jump if it's not zero so if it is zero we won't do the jump and we'll fall into here and we'll decrement the HL register pair so if I press the down button I'm going to decrease the HL which will take us to the next uh, memory address lower um, and then regardless of whether I did the jump or not because if you look at the jump it jumps to the up label so regardless of whether I did the jump or not I'm going to con just continue and check for the up button um, so now I'm setting A with 253 so I'm now looking at the second bit again doing a compare with D to see if the second bit is low um, and if it's not low so we're not zero um, we'll, we'll jump back to the the loop and we'll start the whole thing over again um, but if it is low then we won't do the jump and we'll go down to ink HL so if the up button has been pressed um, we will increment HL and go to the next memory address up and then again regardless of anything that's happened we're, we're always going to jump back to the beginning of the loop so the loop will just continue looping around until it sees a change and then when it sees a change it will check to see if we've pressed the down button it will decrease HL and if we press the up button it will increase HL so I should be able to use those two buttons to control the value of the HL register which will in turn because we keep going around the loop it will call output and it will output the contents of of that memory address so the nice thing about this program is um, rather than uh, just starting at zero and then incrementing HL and outputting me the memory address I can now move backwards and forwards using my input buttons so let's load this onto the EEPROM and have a look at it running with our current setup so as always I'll uh, give it a reset if the program works when I, re when I release the uh, reset button it should at least um, show us memory address 8000 on the red LEDs and it does but you can see it's a little slow getting there 
So I'll press a button. And that did um, decrement down to the next uh, memory address. But as you can see, I have to hold the button down for several seconds and we just slowly see the um, display change. So I'll press the up button this time. I'm pressing it now. And eventually we see a change, but I have to hold the button down for all that time. If I just press and re release the button, I mean, I could get lucky and I might catch it at the exact right time, but it's more than likely just gonna completely miss the fact that I've pressed the button. So I have to hold it down for several seconds, should eventually see it change. Yeah, and I'll release and then hold down again. So we should go to seven F F E eventually. Yeah, it eventually gets there. Um, so it does work, but as you can see, that's very tedious. Um, we really need a, a faster clock here. So I had an idea of what I could do with a faster clock. I've got this circuit, um, which I built a while back, which has a crystal in here. Um, that is a 3.6864 megahertz crystal. Um, I believe this is just using a hex inverter exactly the same as what we're using on our, our board now. It's just that we're feeding it with a, a faster clock rate. Um, but I thought that that might be problematic because if I just turn this off a second and show you the, the reverse of the board. So I've got all this wiring on the back here and that might not behave very well at high frequencies. So I, I really am not sure because I haven't tried it at high frequencies, but I'm just a little uncertain about that. So the idea I originally had was, what if I take the the clock generated from here, that's just over three megahertz, and feed that into a counter chip, which I can then divide that clock down to some slower speeds. Um, so I posted that on the community channel and somebody else came up with a, a different idea. And they suggested to look at this chip here, which is the 4060 um, logic chip. And this is from the 4000 series family. The, the chips I've used so far are from the 7400 series. This one is from the 4000 series, but it's still a CMOS logic chip, so it should um, operate okay quite happily in this system. And I really like the idea of this. And so I, I sort of thought, let's, let's just put this to one side. Let's take a look at this, because what this can do is both of those functions in one chip so it can both provide the oscillator circuit you know, with the, the additional circuitry exactly the same as, as what I've got on this one um, but it also can prov provide the divider the, the counter that will do the, the dividing to slow the clock down to slower slower speeds all on the same chip so I really like the idea of that but I didn't get on very well with it I did some experimenting with it and I first tried it with one of these little um, I think people call them watch crystals. Uh, this is a 32.768 kilohertz crystal, um, which I thought I would have a slower speed. I'm gonna divide down anyway, so that should be okay. But I just couldn't get it to oscillate. Uh, I did eventually get it oscillating, but I really, it was a real struggle. And I found that when I plugged the, um, the output of it into the trainer board, the trainer board just behaved erratically and just didn't work at all. So I, I get, eventually gave up with that. I think the reason is I was using an incorrect value for the feedback resistor. The feedback resistor should be 10 mega ohms and I didn't have any 10 mega ohm resistors. So I was using one mega ohm. And every example I looked at always uses 10 mega ohms. And I, I watched a video of somebody explaining that typical value when using this crystal is um, 10 mega ohms for the feedback resistor. Whereas when you're using um, a, a faster crystal such as one around four megahertz, which is similar to what I've got here. The feedback resistor can be a, a one megahertz, a one mega ohm resistor. So I swapped it out for the for that crystal. And yes, it did oscillate straight away. And um, 
got on reasonably well. And in fact, let's have a look at that on the oscilloscope. So I've got it running. I'm feeding the circuit with five volts from a, from a power supply. And I've got the oscilloscope, it's the red lead here. I'm going into one side of the crystal. And I'll see if I can show you the oscilloscope over here. So I don't know how well you can see on the scope, but down here it tells us the frequency is 3.68. And it's kind of jumping around between 3.68 and 3.7. Um, but something I've recently um, discovered on this oscilloscope is it does have a frequency counter, um, which is a bit more accurate than, than this. My understanding is that the frequency here is just looking at the actual waveform. Um, the, the data that it's capturing by looking at the waveform and calculating the frequency from that. Um, whereas the counter up the top here is actually counting the number of times the signal goes high within a second. And it gives a much more accurate reading and you can see it's quite stable. Um, and it says 3.6863. And our crystal should be oscillating at 6864 so 3.6864 so yeah if we if we rounded that off because the last digit is an 8 that would round up to 3.6864 so it's pr pretty much exactly what it's supposed to be doing um if i then move the um the oscilloscope to one of the outputs on the counter or the uh, the divide down outputs. If I press auto on the scope, it should find that for me. And there it is. And it is showing us a frequency of 57.6 kilohertz. And I experimented um, feeding that into the trainer board and I tried um, different uh, outputs on the 4060 chip and um, pretty much everything worked. So I gradually I started with a slow speed and gradually went up to higher speeds and um, I stopped here at 57.6 kilohertz. I didn't go any higher than that, but, but this worked. So I'll plug that into the trainer board and show you that. So a few things to point out. I'm feeding this circuit from the, the five volt and ground from the trainer board. Um, and I'm taking the, the clock output, the one that I've divided down, and I'm feeding that into the clock connection on the trainer board. So this will now feed our clock circuit. But because I'm doing that, I need to make sure I've turned off my clock here on the dip switches. So we now have both dip switches low. If you remember, the first dip switch is the manual clock second dip switch is the auto clock but that auto clock is a very slow clock so i've turned them both off so the clock is being fed from this line here now if you watch this when i just get rid of this lead if you watch this when i start it up i'll turn the power on and i'll press the reset button and it instantly gives me the 8,000 memory address because we're now running at a faster speed. You can actually see it looks like nearly all the um, control LEDs, the data LEDs and address LEDs are all sort of on all the time. They're actually not, they're switching on and off, but they're doing it so fast that we can't see anymore, which is why I originally ran this thing slow so that we could watch all these signals. At these speeds, we just can't see those signals. Now watch this, when I press these buttons, Look at that, look how fast it is now. I could just press the button and it will instantly change. Just a very short presses on the button. Uh, if you watch this, if we, I've only just noticed this. If we go um, up through here, we're getting random, random contents on, on this. We're not focused very well, are we? Is that better? Um, yeah, when we're up in the RAM, we're getting kind of random values. But if we move downwards, when we go down to address 8,000, I'm going the wrong way, Let's go down to address 8,000. So that's the last, was well, the first byte of RAM, I believe. So if I go down one more, we'll be in the ROM. And in the ROM, 
all the contents are zero because the compiler would have would have set them all to zero. So this is the this is the top of the ROM and there's nothing here. And I can go up to the back to the RAM and we'll start just seeing some random contents. So it would have just started up randomly. We haven't written anything to it. So there's the RAM and there's a load of random contents. So I'm pretty pretty happy with that. It's uh, quite strange. Uh, this LED here is not lit. I suspect I've got something wrong. Maybe a loose connection or something not quite right with that address line. Um, but it doesn't seem to be affecting anything. But clearly there's something not right with that address line. Um, quite happy that the, the, the inputs uh, are working nicely. Um, we have actually got the, the whole board running at a, a much higher speed now. Um, and my uh, slightly more complicated program actually worked. Um, that's probably the longest program we've seen so far in this series. So it does feel like I'm, I'm making good progress. Um, I think I'm reasonably happy with uh, this chip now. Um, and I'm considering possibly removing the uh, the clock that we've got in here and swapping it out with, with this chip um, with the crystal um, rather than just uh, resistors and capacitors. Um, and we'll have a much more control over different clock speeds. Um, it won't be a totally variable clock, which we, I guess we could have done if we wanted to have a completely variable speed, but... Um, it gives us lots of options. We can run at slow speeds, medium speeds, high speeds. And maybe we could have jumpers on here where we could just move the jumper to change the clock speed. Um, but I think before we go any further, we probably should look a little bit more at the, the fast clock circuit. So here's the circuit for the, uh, the fast clock. Um, this part here is essentially a Pierce oscillator. Um, well, it would be, along with some uh, circuitry inside the chip, it would make up a, a Piers oscillator. I think you basically need this circuit here plus an amplifier, so the amplifying component is inside the chip. Um, this resistor here is known as a feedback resistor. Um, you can see it connects across the, the crystal. Well, not, not directly across the crystal, but acro across the, the two sides of the circuit, um, providing feedback. And apparently this value is not super critical, but um, typically um, one mega ohm would, would be a typical value for, for a crystal of this kind of speed. Um, whereas this resistor here, I believe is a bit more critical. And the purpose of this is to limit the, the voltage across the crystal, um, because if the voltage across the crystal is too high, you could damage it, but um, also um, the amount of power that the, the crystal will dissipate will depend upon that voltage amongst other things as well. There are, there are lots of things at play in here, um, but the crystal itself will have a maximum uh, power rating that we mustn't exceed. So that's the purpose of the main purpose of this resistor here. And um, my basic understanding uh, is that um, typically the amplifier will um, shift the phase of the signal and we need the as the signal is fed back um, around the circuit it needs to be in phase um, so if the amplifier is uh, like if we had a simple inverter here may have shifted the phase by 180 degrees because it's inverted the signal we need to shift that phase back round another 180 degrees to get it back in phase again and that's essentially what these um, capacitors do they form RC circuits which shift the phase of the signal to pull it back round to 360 degrees I'm not going to go too much into that because I'm not an expert on on crystal oscillators and I'm just kind of learning this stuff as I'm going along um, but there are uh, various calculations for how to calculate the the values of the um, capacitors I've actually got these wrong I'm using 20 picofarads on mine. Um, if you haven't quite got these right then the actual frequency that you get will be slightly different from what's specified on the crystal. Um, if you get these perfectly correct then you should get the correct frequency out of your crystal. 
Um, so they're fed into uh, pins 10 and 11 on the CD4060 uh, IC. So that's providing the input clock to the chip and then the chip will divide that clock down um, to uh, lower frequencies that we can use and also converts that to square wave because this is, um, if you measure the signal at this point, I believe you'll see the the 3.6864 megahertz signal, but it will be a sine wave. Whereas the outputs, the Q connections here and some more here, uh, will be converted to a square wave and divided down. Um, we don't get all the divisions. We don't get Q1, one and two. Uh, I think it actually starts at zero, Q0, Q1 and Q2. We don't get access to those, but we do get Q, Q3, Q4, Q5, six, seven, eight, nine. We don't get 10, but we do get 11, 12, and 13. I think it's a four, 14 bit counter, um, but we don't get access to all 14 bits. Um, and each bit divides the signal down by two. Um, so that's why I've, I've got all the possible outputs listed here and the frequencies we would get with our given input uh, frequency these are the output frequencies that we would get and I was connected to pin 4 which is actually Q5 that's where I connected the clock on the Z80 and we got 57.6 kilohertz we can see that over on the scope and up here if we look at the frequency counter you can see we are getting pretty much exactly 57.6 kilohertz you can see a few digits across it's very slightly off but it's pretty close um, if we look at um, some of the other connections, if I move over to pin 3 and adjust the scope a bit, I'm going the right way, and we can see they were getting 225 hertz, and if we look back at our chart, uh, pin 3 would be Q13 and Q13, yeah, 225 hertz. That's actually the slowest speed we can get out of it. Let's try um, one over on the other side of the chip. Go for this one. What's that? Pin 9, 10, 11, 12. Pin 13. Pin 13 is Q8. Q8 is 7.2 kilohertz. And on the scope, yeah, 7.2 kilohertz. And I've made a little mistake here. Uh, master reset pin 12 is active high. So we don't want to pull it high. We want to pull it low to disable it. So I'm going to need a ground connection oh, that's pulled low so that, that's basically uh, the circuit and how the CD4060 works by dividing the, the clock down so we get a few choices here um, not quite sure what I'm going to do with this yet because although I'm reasonably happy with the 57.6 kilohertz and we possibly could try some higher speeds um, we don't really need to go much higher with a simple trainer board like this, but I would actually like to go a bit lower. I'd like to be able to slow it down a bit, a bit more than 225 hertz. And we've still got the single step feature. Um, I mean, we could potentially leave our existing slow clock in there um, so to get the slower speed. So we could we could just have both of these clocks and select them with a jumper. Um, I might I might well do that. Um, but it would simplify the design a bit if I could take the other clock out and swap it out with this one, which does seem a bit more versatile. So yeah, so that's the that's the fast clock, the 4060, and we saw a little bit more of the, the input circuits. So I'll leave this video here, and I think next time, not quite sure where to go next, but I think I might go back to looking at the mechanical keyboard, um, see if I can progress that forward a bit. So we might look at that next time. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.